this story. Let me start by saying this is not really the derivative of mocking provision, it's just the abstract part of the derivation. I haven't done any part of the actual calculation. Okay, so then I just want to tell you what is the general type of calculation that is involved in the, the actual actual calculation is not so I don't think it's fundamental and, 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 and I think one can get the idea of what's going on from, from this after story. So let me repeat briefly the, the story that, that I told you yesterday. The, the story, the, the issue is to want to construct something that resembles the quantization of a system of n particles with positions x i and momentum p i that satisfy the commutation relations, the fundamental commutation relations. So we want <coughs> to start with the classical theory of this of these objects and construct a quantum theory of this object, meaning these objects now become operators acting on a Hilbert space, and for that we need to construct both the operators and the Hilbert space. And the, the object we want to quantize now is this object phi, which now has an index, the same way that this index tells you which particle you're talking about, here, the index x tells you which point in space are you talking about. And if we are going to do it relativistically, it's going to begin to, to work in the Heisenberg picture, then this thing becomes directly uh, an operator index, in a sense, by, by space and points. And we want this operator to satisfy a certain equation. <clears throat> and then we want, out of this operator, we construct this other object called the momentum conjugate, which is, in a sense, the corresponding thing to the time derivative. I'm talking about the space time that we have foliated with Cauchy hypersurfaces labeled by a parameter t. <clears throat> And then the equivalent of this relation, the equivalent version of this relation in that continuum context is this expression here where uh, I have made a mistake here, it should be y. That's the that's simply an obvious generalization of this expression. In Newtonian uh, physics, uh, uh, we have particles, and, and in um, field theory, we have uh, the, the role, the, the objects which we are treating are points of, of, of a field. No, are, are fields. The objects were points, but where the particles are, are, are fields, and fields are associated with, are functions that are associated with each point. Now, this field at each point has to become an operator. Right. At every point, the field is an operator. Yeah, this is quite abstract uh, object, yes. Every point of the field is, is an operator. No, at every point of space-time, at every point of space-time, there is an operator. Like, for every particle, there is a position. Yes. Operator. Okay, and the way we, the way we do it, is we look for classical solutions to the equations of motion. This object, this, these are classical solutions to these equations. We make a collection of all possible classical, well, a complete set of classical solutions to that, to those equations, and separate them into things that have positive norm and things that have negative norm. In, Flat space in, in, in flat Minkowski space time, that separation can be done canonically by choosing one of them as having positive energy and the other one as having negative energy. The things that have positive energy automatically have positive norm, 
the things that have negative energy automatically have, have negative, no? So then the separation is very clear. The problem in curved space time is that that separation is not, we don't know how to do it canonically. And then we have this, in a sense, ambiguity. We can construct the field using, using, uh, sorry. When, once I choose this collection of, of solutions to the classical equations, <coughs> I construct this object by introducing these operators that are going to be playing the role of creation and annihilation operators. <coughs> because when I impose this condition, these commutation relations between the field and the conjugate momentum, the relations that are imposed between these operators by the way, by the way, <coughs> That these uh, uh, that these objects have been normalized and the relationships between them become the standard type of rel commutation relations that appear in the quantization of the harmonic oscillator. So now I have converted my problem in the problem of dealing with an infinite set of harmonic oscillators, and that we know how to do it. We know how to, to, come to, to, to proceed to construct the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is constructed by postulating the existence of an object of a, of, of, that we call the vacuum state that is defined by the property that is an, annihilated, and by that I mean all these operators that I happen to call annihilation operators that are associated with uh, functions of the, of, 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 of the, the wrong norm are <coughs> yeah. give zero when acted uh, uh, upon by oh, sorry this state is produces zero the, when acted upon by one of these annihilation operators and then the Hilbert space is simply obtained by application of creation operators in this fashion and the point of creating this the point of creating this uh, collection of, 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 of states as a means of constructing the Hilbert space is that the commutation relations that I imposed before that we, we discovered before that we obtained before automatically tell me, tells me what should be the inner product between these objects. And the inner product between these objects is very simple. And now I construct the inverse space by producing all linear combinations, all possible linear combinations of these elements of the basis and producing the Cauchy completion to make sure that it's, a, it's an actual space. Okay, with, with that, as I said, we can construct things like the energy momentum tensor and so forth. And then the subtlety appears in the fact that there is an ambiguity, or I have a, a, a very large degree of freedom of how I choose these functions u. If, I have cho if, the, if this is a function of positive norm, and this one is one of negative norm, then I can construct a new solution of positive norm, provided that these coefficients are chosen to satisfy this relation. The norm of this of this object is also going to be positive, but certainly this object is is, is a different so solution than than this one. And there, when I rewrite my field in terms of the of the new set of solutions. I find the relationship between the new creation and annihilation operators that reflects this relation between the old and the new set of solutions to the, the problem. And that leads me to a situation in which I will have two constructions of the quantum theory, two constructions of a Hilbert space 
one based on those on those on, on the vacuum associated with the annihilation operators A that we introduced before and one new vacuum state which is associated with the new annihilation operators and since the two are not the same then these two states are not the same this state gives zero when acted upon by A but does not give zero when acted upon by B And as I said, if, on the other hand, so in general, curve space times, this ambiguity stays and remains, and, and, and there is nothing to do about it. We just need to learn, learn to live with it. However, in situations in which the space time is stationary in some regime, for example, in the past, if the space time is stationary in the past, I can make the construction by choosing the solutions that in the past behave as positive energy solutions. If the Andy, yes, can you say can you say a little bit more about how in arbitrary curved space times we learn to live with it? You mean there isn't a, an unambiguous fact in such situations about whether there are particles around or not? Yeah. Yeah. And, so what do you, t t tell me a little more about what you mean by we learn to live with it. Well, that you will, you will do calculations in principle if you have some information of how certain state was created. Right. You will work with that state and it will not be clear if that state has 10 particles. It, 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 there will be no right. there won't be fact a of the matter, matter right. of whether there are right. particles um, or not. You just you just tell me what procedures you were using. What was the I method see. by which you and there'll be and, and there'll be ambiguity about the method by which whether or not the method by which I detect particles is the right one or not. Right or something like right. That. Okay. If you use this particular set, yeah. you will detect particles. If you okay. do this other thing, you will yeah, not yeah, detect yeah. particles. Okay. And, and that's okay. Fair enough. Good. And this is where the other effect. And that's what? The under effect? And this is what the word right. effect. Right. Good, good, good. good. Uh, quick question. Usually when you have this problem, you even have inequivalent Fox space representations. So yeah. one has even infinitely many particles compared to the yeah. vacuum. Yeah. The they're, they're unita in general, they are unitary and equivalent. And we nevertheless learn to deal with that. But so this is also what happens here. So the one vacuum is not just not empty, but it's infinitely empty. Yep. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> there is a theorem called Feld's theorem that lets you, despite the fact that the two fact that the two constructions are unitarily equivalent inequivalent, for any set of observables, any finite set of observables, and any finite uh, tolerances, you can construct, if given a state in one of the constructions, there is at least one corresponding state that within those tolerances reproduces exactly the, the, the features of the state in the other construction. So that's what allows us to basically let's say we don't care about. Can, can I make, again, this is just kind of a, a check on myself. Because what Justin just said sounds really astonishing, right? You could have an ambiguity between being in a vacuum state with no particles and a state with an infinite number of particles. That's pretty bad, right? right? But if 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 my understanding, the way I've come to terms with Unru is correct, it goes, all Unru has discovered is that if you take something that, that when it's in inertial motion is a good particle detector and accelerate it. It'll fire as if it were detecting particles when there ain't no particles. And which doesn't surprise you too much. You're accelerating it. It has to have charges in it if it was going to detect anything. And you accelerate charges, and that creates radiation. And it, the, the spots on the screen or whatever might look like particle detectors detections. But if you say, 
again, the operating instructions were don't accelerate this thing and just say, okay, this is just this thing that's firing. And that would misfire an infinite number of times if you accelerated it for an infinite period of time is completely unsurprising, right? Mm -hmm. If that's the right analysis. Okay. So is that, did I just say anything wrong? Yes, you did. Okay. I mean, the Daniel effect actually does detect particles. It's not fake in the detection of particles. Well, so well, what do you mean by that? Well, different observers will see different things. This is the, the point. So they no, no, but not, but, 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 but. Uh, no, he, no, 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 they, they will see flashes in the apparatus. Yeah. But he, but then say, what happens if you say the apparatus is to be used inertially? Then you yes. think, okay, then you are used, they, they would say you are using the apparatus in the wrong way. The point, the problem, of course, in curved space time is that there are no generic apparatus. I cannot tell you what are the right apparatuses and so forth. I think what Tim said, well, not wrong, is a bit misleading. Okay. Because like, we talk about are there particles there or something like some that. Uh, what we're dealing with is a, is a field theory, and the vac vacuum state is is the, the, the lowest energy in, in the Kaspi space as a unique lowest energy uh, state, and um, you've got what you call a particle detect the detectable fire if there are, ex are excited modes of the, of, the, of, the, of the thing, and then. It's not that the I agree. It's not that the unreal detector is somehow misleading you about what kind of state it is. It's a, it's a, it's telling you it's the sort of state that this detector will fire lots of times if, it, if it's accelerated. Right. So you, yeah. So there'll be two gadgets here, two gadgets which have the same physical constitution, both of which you are, are are using correctly. One says don't accelerate, and the other one says please don't, please accelerate. Right. And that's perfect. And and, and now here, there's in 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 the um, Minkowski space, there's a um, there's, there's some kind of symmetry that, that 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 says, okay, we can pick out a privileged class of um, inertial trajectory tra trajectories and say what happens to this detector along that, and then in in um, general space time, we, we don't. So can you go back and what? what Wait, I didn't that? understand how. how I, I, I just don't understand how you were criticizing. I, 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 I don't if, 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 if it if it says on the box, right. use unaccelerate. Right. And if there's another box that says accelerate me. Yes. Right. The other box instruction manual should also say things like if you see this kind of pattern of flashes on the screen, you're in a vacuum. You're in a you're in a you're in a vacuum. Not you, you did not that these par, these flashes indicate particles. It should say this is the this is the, the right. indication of vacuum. Yes, yeah, so let, let me draw let, let me okay, draw yes. this thing because there is a key point. Yeah. Here. If you have this detector here and you follow it and it never flashes, you don't know that you are in the vacuum. You will only know that you are in the vacuum if you feel space time right. with yeah, yeah, yeah. detectors everywhere. Of course. Yes. And you. And these detectors are all uh, arranged to detect all kinds of modes. Yes, yes, yes. And then you will be able to to, to Great. Uh, uh, Yes, I understand. And this is going to be a pro This is what you cannot generalize to, to, to curve space time. Because you can decide, OK, I'm going to follow this particular observer. Now we're back Geodesi to geodesically, right. right? And he's not accelerated. That's the version of not accelerating. And I will say, Okay, does his detector click or not? And we'll say, well, he doesn't detect click, he hasn't seen Mario. Well, first of all, he doesn't know if there are no extensions anywhere else. And moreover, he doesn't know if his detector is extended enough to the interact with particles that have wavelengths that are so this is, this is where it becomes subtle. Right. And, and let me just say this, I don't want to put it one way or the other. There was a mathematical question you left unanswered yesterday which is the conditions under which you can affiliate a, a, a space-time with time-like geodesics. To yeah. me, it's not, maybe there's something you just can't at all. Maybe there, maybe you can generally do it. If you do it, those time-like geodesics will presumably vary in their distances, unlike in Minkowski, where not only can you affiliate it, but the things remain. And, and then if your detectors have to have finite size, then you get into trouble because they have to bump into each other. 
right? Yeah. Um, so you know, we might, but but even if they had finite size, you could ask, well, is there a state in which every inertial trajectory, tra trajectory in this affiliation, if it were just that one, didn't fire? Right. And, and 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 of course, you need. I'm not saying one guy with one detector can tell if it's a vacuum. Of course not. You could decide right. to stay far away. Yeah. But yeah, I'm assuming that you somehow fill fill the space with local detectors. Right. And, 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 and one of the issues, one of the issues that I mentioned is that generically, geodesics will cross. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay. I, I just want to respond to what Thomas said. So if you look at this situation, you've got the you, you've got the U's and you've got the V's are related by a transformation, and you can say, okay, what I mean by the U vacuum is something that is annihilated by all the U's, and I, and I write zero U. And what I mean by this, the V vacuum is something that's not annihilated by all the Vs. Those are just different states. Mm -hmm. I would say, you could say something completely analogous in flat space time. You write down the, you, you know, the, the, the usual oper operators, and then you've also got the Ringling operators, mm -hmm. and you can say there's a state that's which we call the ordinary Minkowski vacuum, which has all the symmetries of Minkowski space time. In that state, Minkowski vacuum, the accelerated detector fires, and the, 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 the other. And then you can also say, well, we've got these transformed uh, uh, operators. There's another state that's not laid by those, called that the regular vacuum, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're just different states. So. Right. So you want to say the Minkowski vacuum is the vacuum. Mm -hmm. oh. It's the vacuum with respect to that. You know, um, that you know, it, that that's the. So the, 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 the so I think that's a very. Let me tell you something yes. that, 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 yes. that I think will help. Really. In principle, even in Minkowski space time, we will have different notions of time according to. For different inertial observers, sure. and it could have been, it could have been that when we do the construction for one inertial mm -hmm. collection, and we do the construction for another inertial, we, you get, we you get the same thing. Yeah. It happens to be that if the particles have positive mass, if if you are in the, the field equations I gave you, the thing, the mass is positive. Every solution that is positive solution energy solution with respect to some observer is also a positive solution with respect to another observer. So this problem does not occur. Right. Right. The vacuum for one Minkowski observer is the, same. the same. But this this relies very strongly on this on this feature. If I allow you to have particles with if I put negative mass there, yeah. then this will not longer be the feature. Sure. And and then you will have the same problem. Even in Minkowski space. Yeah. And then you don't know what is you know, sure, particle and what is sure, sure, that, 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 that's fine. I will just make one final answer. It, it is, I, I think, worthy of note that if I, if, if in the operating instructions of the detector it says be inertial, yeah, I can build an operate such a thing. And if, if it's supposed to be a Rimbler detector and the operating instructions are constantly accelerate, I cannot build an operate. I can't, no, I, I can't make a rocket big enough. I'll run out of fuel. I just can't ah, make a physical ah, device ah, and, ah, and infinitely ah, accelerate. Ah, I can't do it. This is, a, this is not just a difference in, oh, you know, it's apples and oranges. No, it's things I can do and things I can't do. Yeah, you can make any device that's going to last forever. So but no, why, why not? Why can't a device last forever? <laughs> Everything breaks down eventually. Why? What, by what physical principle is that true? Rusty. <laughs> By what physical principle is it true? I just want to know. It's a serious question. It's a serious question. What what physical principle tells you I can't build the device in the last forever? There's no physical principle. It's just all the devices that we've ever built won't last forever. And so, 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 so you want to have to work for everything. Yeah, I mean, this is this is trying to be. No, I'm uh, trying to make a serious point that I think yeah, yeah, you'll respond to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but let me give you another so, serious yeah. point. Yeah. Our space time is not in cosmic space. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so sure. Yeah. So we, so we have, whether we like it or not, we have to learn a little bit about this. Yeah. <laughs> so Tim, um, it seems there's, there's a sort of parallel here with, you know, when we do special relativity, we start by constructing a clock with bouncing light between mirrors, which no one has ever done. And then we have to say, all right, 
actually this result works for all blocks. Yeah. And there's something, I don't know if it, it makes a difference here, but every different type of, of uh, particle detector fires up mm -hmm. in under these conditions. Mm -hmm. Which, does that tempt you to say, okay, well, uh, this is not simply software. Let, let, let me tell you what the thought is behind it. Right. You know, if the thing is inert, so I just build it and let it go, yeah. and I've got a screen on it, and all of a sudden dots appear on the screen. Yeah, so that's actually you know, lights coming off and so on. And I asked myself the question kind of naively, well, where did the energy for that come from? And the answer is, oh, there were these particles out there that were carrying energy. Sure. And they, they hit the screen, blah, blah, blah. I think that's now, if I, okay, but I'm just, okay. I'm not, I'm just saying, if I put the thing on a rocket and I'm constantly accelerating it and the screen is going ping, 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 and I say, I wonder where the energy for those pings came from. The answer might well be from the damn rocket. Sure. Okay. And maybe there are no particles. Right? Yeah. What you're seeing is an effect of accelerating, you know, which you expect by, you know, by Gramsci and so on. You expect that accelerating charged things will have effects, dynamical effects on the things that can show up and look like hits. You, 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 you get a massive grant, and so you build one entirely out of wind force. There's no charge piling around, and it starts being up. Is that a large? I, I don't know. I, I I would have to think through that case. I've never given it. Yeah, I literally just made it up. I don't talk about it. Okay. But we'll go for the massive brain. <laughs> okay. Okay. He sent some of the money here. Sure. Wait, wait, let's continue. Yep. Yeah, sorry. This was meant to be a quick review of that <laughs> because I want to get to another issue. Uh, I think the thing that message is that you know, particles are not really the best way to think about things. Yeah. That's the lesson that I think I get. Yeah. Um, okay, so the point, the point that I made yesterday is that, however, if I have a space time that goes from one situation which is stationary to another situation which is stationary, then I recover now two notions of energy. For instance, the space time can be Minkowski space time for a while. You could have a cosmology that is static and for a while, and suddenly the universe accelerates and then stops again for some reason. And you went from Minkowski space time to another Minkowski space time. What was the solution that corresponded to positive energy solutions in the past do not match to the solutions that correspond to positive energy solutions in the in the future, and then you will have this feature that the two notions of vacuum that are natural are not the same, and you will have particle creation. And this is the story of what ha happens in, in in the case of, of a collapse that produces black hole. You start with the cloud, uh, what the word? Diffuse. 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 Cloud of gas, you are basically static, you know what energy means, you set your field in the vacuum, you let the cloud collapse, form a black hole. The, the interior of the black hole, everything goes to hell, but in the exterior things settle down eventually and you return to a situation which is stationary. Not the as they was concerned yesterday, the there is a clear asymmetry between the two situations, right? In one case, you have one region that is stationary and it evolves in the future to two things one region that is stationary and one region that is completely crazy. Okay. Then, then can, can I ask one more question about that, though? Yes, of course, it was silly of me to ask it in terms of symmetry. But, but <clears throat> here's a different way to ask about what was puzzling me. How come we chose to set the vacuum at the beginning of the collapse rather than at the end. No. It's an assumption that the initial state was the vacuum at the beginning. This is an assumption. But you could, could there you is motivate there that is for me? Technically you could have put something very you could have if we put it at the end then we have particle disappearance rather than particle creation. Right? If we put the vacuum at the end and then evolved it backwards and found that it wasn't the vacuum. Wait, first of all, if you want to evolve backwards, you have to put the something in the end yeah, and then exactly. something in the interior. Right. Okay. And, and 
To do this, you have to be very careful because you want to ensure that on the horizon, the state is regular. So it's but, not but here's what I'm asking. Is there some, is there some compelling or principled reason to set things up the way we did? Or is it just calculational convenience? No, physically we imagine that when you start with a black hole, you know, yes, there are some bunch of, there is a bunch of particles, but nothing dramatic, mm -hmm. right? Actually, if you start with a few particles, you will end up but with a few naive. particles and, and, and the Hawking radiation. Yeah, but so naively, we didn't expect these particles to be around at the end either. That's what's striking about Hawking radiation. Right. So, why, why did we choose to do it the way we did as opposed to the other? Well, we, we, because we s normally seem to assume we have good information about the initial conditions and not about the final conditions. Okay. Like we set initial data okay. and we presumably know enough how our detectors explore the region and I want to make predictions. If I were to describe this finding as just showing that there's this kind of mismatch between natural notions of the vacuum prior to the collapse and after the collapse and leave it at that and then say, okay, this is going to lead me to expect either particle creation or particle disappearance. I mean, that's clearly not the way people talk about it. Yeah. Well, I would say you have to put the whole, this whole thing within the context of our understanding of cosmology. Mm -hmm. You know, our universe, right. okay. our universe has been expanding for a long time, right. except for some regions where there are galaxies right. and stuff. Right. Most of the rest of the stuff is right. Right. Okay. empty. It's not completely empty, it's filled with CMB radiation. Right. And right, 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 right. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so this, this, is, this is the point of, of uh, uh, the essence of Hawking radiation, which we saw then gives a very, you know, strong, uh, makes the, 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 the thing that was simply an analogy between, between the loss of black hole dynamics and the loss of thermal dynamics, makes it much, much stronger and, and has convinced most physicists that, that in some sense they are the same, that in some sense they are two versions of the same story and that area over four is the entropy of the black hole and then there is this puzzle of why is the generalized second law valid and I mentioned that the natural explanation for, for, the, for, for such a feature would be a scheme in which we could separate from how the states count separately the states inside the black hole, the states outside the black hole, and that somehow, well, and, and that then we would compute the, 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 the Boltzmann of this person of this time in a quantum gravity scheme because you are supposed to, the black hole entropy, first of all, has an expression, I can put things. Uh, in, but there is Planck length appearing in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the expression for for uh, for entropy. In other words, if entropy was dimensionless, in here area would have to come divided by Planck length squared. And if entropy you wanted to give it the standard notions, you would multiply by uh, the standard dimensions. You would multiply <coughs> by by Boltzmann constant. <laughs> anyway, so this is supposed to be a quantum version and a quantum version of the of the story, so perhaps a quantum gravity version of the story. And then you would count the number of of, of states compatible with your macro state that presumably is is described by giving your description of what's going on outside the black hole, the clouds of gases, the radiation that are over there, and the area of all the black holes that are present in your in the hypersurface you are trying to associate an entropy with. Uh, and then this quantity will be the generalized law, the generalized uh, uh, 
entropy that would satisfy the generalized second law if it happens to be true that the number, the total number of possible states compatible with that description of your macro state uh, for the interior region of the black hole was A over 4, and then I argue that this is very difficult to conceive, and certainly it's not anything that is uh, being done by, by the approaches that we have at hand. And then I mentioned two type of approaches I discussed this last year. And, uh, uh, in, in more details, there is, I'm, I'm not an expert in either of those, but what I can tell you is that the string theory approach seems to come, well, first makes a duality between this situation in which you have a black hole and, and whatever, and something, and, and something else that doesn't where black hole notions have disappeared, you have strings wrap around brains and things of that sort. And you count the number of states with a certain charge. <coughs> and then they have a mapping of that situation to, to the, the, that situation is supposed to be dual to the situation containing a black hole. And then for extremal or near extremal black holes, they have, they have this relationship between the counting, but the counting has no information whatsoever about where are the degrees of freedom that you are counting. So, if they, the most natural explanation of what they are counting is the total number of degrees of freedom of everything inside and outside. And this is not what we want. Then there is the quantum graphic, the quantum graphic approach in which they count the degrees of freedom just on the horizon. Just the degrees of freedom on the horizon, not all the degrees of freedom in the interior. And we started the discussion yesterday that I would like to please postpone because I want to say sometimes I'm happy to have it, but let's do it after I go to my third point because it's something I think people should be very worried about. And then there's the final story, the final scheme, which seems to be more closer to the idea of somehow counting the degrees of freedom in the, in, in the interior or, uh, or something of that sort by computing this entanglement entropy between the inside and the outside. You, the calculation we did is basically take Minkowski spacetime, remove a sphere, and Put the state in the vacuum, well, put the, first put the state of the vacuum, remove the interior, remove the, the, the interior of the sphere, and compute the reduced density matrix and use it to compute the von Neumann uh, uh, entropy. And they obtain a result that is infinite. Yes. So can I just ask conceptually this makes no sense to me because if I take a system and partition it into two parts, whatever's the, you know, presumably in some entangled state, if this is going to do anything, right? It's yeah, when the vacuum is a high yeah, state, I have an entangled state, I have a system, I, I do partition it into two parts, and I calculate the entanglement. Um, that is, that, that does not kick out one part of the other. Yeah, and you would expect, depending on the partition, the number of degrees of freedom is going to be very different, right? I can put all, all of it over there. So how can that number be telling me about the number of degrees of freedom in the interior if it's neutral between the interior and the exterior? It's always equal. One taken. Okay, it's uh, very clear. So it's a farther. I only said that this. This is closer because at least it's talking <laughs> about the two and separating the two is not doing it in any appropriate way. The, the other two schemes do, do not okay. do not even separate, do not even yeah. distinguish, okay. do not even <clears throat> concern themselves with this. Yeah. However, my central point my, of, of that story is that even if you can try to make some house sense of the story or blah, 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 yeah. I mean, you could try to make sense of the story in the following way and say, well, this would be the, by computing it in the vacuum, you would say, 
this would be the degrees of freedom that you lost by removing this sphere and this entanglement and entropy somehow is counting those degrees of freedom. And then when you put the rest of the stuff in the outside, right, which is not entangled with the inside, you will get this additional contribution that would be. I have to think Yeah, but I'm trying, yeah, I'm just thinking of, I have to edit it and I'm trying to get the. That would be the devil's advocate for a moment, but, that, but not for too long. <laughs> uh, okay, but one very serious aspect of this thing is that they mean the result is proportional to the area, but the coefficient, the proportionality constant is infinite. To make it finite, you need to remove a little shell of thickness, plant length around the black hole, and then <coughs> people talk about things like the stretch horizon and things like that. And then this is the next subject I want to talk about you to warn you of things that you should, you know, be concerned when, when, when you hear talks about these things. And this is now we're going to go to things that are relatively simple. How to make sense of the notion in, in first in special relativity and then in general relativity of the notion of the distance from a point to an hypersurface. So let me start with Minkowski space and in two dimensions. Well, if I have a spatial, spatial uh, hypersurface and I have a point that is not on that spatial hypersurface, I can look at the geodesics that connect that point to the iron surface and look for the one that has the longest proper time. And I could define that to be the time separation between this point and the iron surface. That, but there's no problem. That notion actually can be ge can generalize, uh, well, first of all, dimensions readily and, and then to um, and then to curve space times <coughs> if if the point is close enough if the point is, is too far away there may be more than one uh, maximizing locally maximizing geodesic and I think it will become a little bit more ambiguous but okay here at least that short distances make sense. Now let's think about the proper distance. So now this was a time like separation. Now let's think about the proper distance between a time like hypersurface. Time like hypersurface, I mean there is at least one direction that is time like, and the other directions are space like. Okay? And a point, a separated point. And I would like to talk about the spatial separation between this and that. And this is a little bit more complicated. So, <clears throat> in flat space, I will consider, for instance, all space, all possible space like hypersurfaces containing my point and intersecting the time like hypersurface on the line. And for each one of those, this is a space like hypersurface, so here I have an Euclidean metric. And then I can look for the minimal distance. But that's only the minimal distance in this hypersurface. And now I will consider all possible such hypersurfaces. And from that, from that set, choose the one that is maximal. It, for which that minimal, is that maximum. Infinite? Sorry? Is it obvious that that's not infinite? I mean, suppose I put, start putting wi waves in this, like this. No, OK. Flat. Oh, flat. Oh, flat. Flat. Okay. flat. Flat are our surfaces. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. OK, good. Yes. No. Good. Your space time, I'm going to have that problem. But here, good. Here I, 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 yeah, I, have, I have this. 
Uh, this can, I have a short calculation of this. This can be done explicitly and it produces for you the, the, the right result. What, what is, in sense, is the right result? You would produce the, <coughs> you would produce something uh, uh, more or the following. Choose the, choose the time direction and look at an inertia frame that moves with the time in that time direction and look at the simultaneity hypersurface on that and on that of, of, of those hypersurface of simultaneity choose the one that contains the point and then on that find the and this will define for you the spatial separation between a point and a time like hypersurface. Fine. What happens in the case of a null hypersurface? It is a, is a, if you if you're not uh, have never done this and you want, this is a nice exercise in special relativity that you can do it. And if you want, I can send give you the solution. It's a couple of pages long. Okay, anyway. Uh, this tends to a null hypersurface. So let's start in two dimensions. So I'm going to be very explicit here. Put uh, some inertial coordinates some coordinates associated with an inertial observer, x and t. Put my point, well, the metric, is the Minkowski metric, and then I'm going to produce a hypersurface given by the hypersurface is x equal, okay, I have it written there, so t is equal, t is equal x plus a, so when t is zero, I go to a, and this, so I do that, and then I have set my 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 origins so they cross the in the, in the, in the, the origins at the point of interest. So I would like to compute my separation between this point and this hypersurface. Okay, I look at consider for instance connecting this point with a geodesic. A geodesic on this space-time is very easily written. M would be the slope of this, of this, uh, of this curve. So in, here, in this case, my slope is negative in this, in this drawing. And, and I can compute where is the point of intersection. So the intersection between that hypersurface which in this case is also a line, and this geodesic that goes through the origin it occurs at this point. And now I compute the separation between these two points and I get this expression that clearly depends on M. And now I ask myself what well what is the natural value of those that thing can take? Obviously, if I choose M equal, for instance, zero, uh, if I choose n equals zero, I will obtain the value minus a squared, sorry, a squared, or n equals zero, which indicates that I, since this is positive death, this is death, this is positive, now I have a space-like separation of a, and that's the separation between these two points. And if I chose n equal to infinity, I would get the, well, depends if I choose plus infinity or minus infinity, I would choose, sorry, I would choose, uh, no, for m, for both, m plus or minus infinity, I would go to minus a squared, and that would correspond to this, to this point. But otherwise, I would get any, any possible value, this, this function, ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
to sustain possible value. The only reason that I get something where A appears here is because I chose this particular frame. In any other frame, it would, you know, I would not be able to identify it. In other words, this, this, this separation is anything you want. There is no canonical way to choose the value of M, and therefore there is no canonical way to choose what you would call the separation between this book and the eight percent. Okay? Adding two more coordinates is not going to change anything at all. The same problem is going to occur. So in other words, in flat Minkowski space it makes no sense to talk about the separation between a point and a null surface. Right? So that should be already a warning. Now what? Okay, everybody's clear about this? So as I said, in, in four dimensions I can, well, I will still have this, all these values available and then I could have, I could have the, this value that is arbitrary, any other positive value, and then we are in the same, in the same situation. <clears throat> so how about the situation in curved space then? Surprisingly, we may have some chances of doing, defining something because in curved space time, there are some special coordinates associated with, for instance, situations of, of symmetry. A, north, a, a very special case is a, a case in which we have st statistics. <coughs> for instance, we have the killing field, which in short space time is, is, is the, the percent corresponds to the in, to the word lines or the velocities that are that are uh, that correspond to the motion of uh, static observers. So <coughs> I may want to define the distance between a point P and a specific node hypersurface in the following way. If I have a killing field Killing field, the time length killing field. All. And then I may decide, for instance, to choose a surface that is orthogonal to this killing field. And then that surface, if this killing field is time length, that surface will be space like. On a space like Riemannian surface, I know what the distance is, and I compute the distance from here to here, and I call that the distance the natural distance between my point and fine. Let's consider doing this in the case in the case of a, of Nikoski of, of, of the Schwarzschild map. So in this case this case, well, let me just paint. Our coordinates are not good at the horizon, but it doesn't matter because I only need to, I only need to take the limit as I approach the horizon. So I take this point and I want to measure its distance to the horizon in this fashion. Look that I have this the killing field, the field DDT, which means is that is the field that whose integral lines are the lines that have all the other coordinates constant except the t coordinate of Schwarzschild space time. And then the orthogonal hypersurface is the surface of t equal constant. That's why I have the metric, I set t equal constant, and on this hypersurface I measure the distance. Uh, 
the distance from my point to the to the to the horizon. And then what I basically have to do is integrate this the square root of this quantity, I fix theta and phi equal to, to zero, I'm moving the radial direction. That's the geodesic connecting, connecting these two things. And then I have an expression for the distance, and this is actually this expression converges. It seems to be a problem here, but it, there is no real problem. The, the, this diverges sufficiently smoothly or visible can be planned, and it's classifying a value, and uh, everything seems to be fine. And then I have apparently defined, but wait, wait, wait. yes. Can I just have a short, quick question? Yeah. What is, if there's more than one killing field, you do this for each one, you get the power of your answer. Right. But we have, in the case of Schwarzschild space time, we have just one single time length field. Okay. Second question. Suppose I had no killing fields at all. Suppose I, I, I tried the following scheme. Maybe you're going to talk about this. Take all the space like geodesics, all of them that go from my right point uh, to the to the to the surface. Okay. Each of those will have a proper length. Yep. Yeah. Take the maximum. The minimum will obviously be zero, but take the maximum. Won't that give me something that doesn't require a killing field that will be kind of uniquely defined? It seems to me that's sort of what you're doing. You're just doing it in kind of two steps. Why should I think it's the maximum? Why, why, well, how, why would you think there isn't a... Remember, these have to be geodesics. Not just any old path. If it was any old path, of course, there would be no maximum. But these would be the pieces. Why would you think there isn't one? As I tip, I go from zero to zero. Why not think that there's a maximum among, among that? Well, in flat space time, we saw that the infinite is the maximum, right? Why? If I, I, well, if they're geodesics, if they're in not just any space like path, the space like geodesics. Yeah, so let's look at the flat space time or flat, flat case. The flat case, this is the expression for the distance between your point when you choose your geodesic characterized by the value n. n can have now any value between minus infinity to infinity. Okay? I don't understand. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't. Take, make this flat space time. Make, yeah. make it flat two dimensional space. Time. Yes. So all the space like G of E6 from your point to this surface are in this wedge. Right? And at their lengths, right, there's gonna there's gonna be a draw the light cone from your point. The light cone? Yeah. And and down. And I agree to the past one too. Ah, okay, so well let's see. So the question is, right, so obviously going up. I'm going to hit zero. Now the question is going down. Does that what, what happens in the limit going down? Does that get longer and longer? Okay, let's look. Let, let, let's look at the uh, at the value. You are. I think what you're going is to uh, n going to, uh, to to approaching one slope approaching one from uh, okay from above. Uh -huh. Same thing. So this is going to go infinite if I go this way. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I think I think the same thing is going to happen. I see. Okay. No, no. I see now. I do. I, I, the image in my head. That was correct. Okay. So. So this will produce, this calculation will measure the distance from this point to this point, which is actually this bifurcation, the so-called bifurcation surface. And then you would have, you would say, I'm fine. Except this story is only valid for, for okay, so 
first of all, this story, I could tell you this story because I had the killing field that defined this, that allowed me to define this hypersurface all the way to the intersection with the horizon. And then I had this recipe and I get a, a number. Actually, that integral is this so-called I know, I, I always forget the name of this. Uh, this variable, it will make this change of variable. I think it's a new, it's a new variable. Okay, that's enough. However, let's look at what happens to. This is the graph of a realistic black hole, a black hole that is produced by collapse. So in this black hole, <coughs> Even in the, in the spherical symmetric case, this is a spherical symmetric case, case, I have Schwarzschild solution in the outside and a killing field in the outside. But here inside the matter, which is the place where this bifurcation hypersurface would have lied if, if it was, if the matter continued in Schwarzschild. Or is the point where the horizon we want to start? Inside this region, space time is not stationary. I don't have a killing field. So I, if, I, if I start with a point here and I try to do this, I'm going to be, I will be able to continue until I reach the matter that is collapsing. Then I will not know what to do. I don't know how to continue. Therefore, I cannot measure the distance from this point to the hypersurface by this recipe. So I cannot make sense of that in a realistic black hole. Is, is this clear? Just maybe just give it a kind of lost track of why we are okay because th this story look this story told me look at this hypersurface, this surf hypersurface T equal constant, which was a a, a, a clearly identified per surface because it was passed through my point and it's orthogonal to the time by killing field everywhere. No, no, more, more basically, like why, why are we, why do, are you convincing us that there's no well defined notion of distance to the event horizon? What's the? Oh, because because you there are lots of arguments that are based on the idea that at plant length from the horizon something dramatic happens. And these are called the stretch horizons or like more ideas of that sort. I started by telling you that in order to compute this entanglement entropy, you have to remove this shell at the certain distance, you know, at the certain separation from the horizon. And I say, well, in Minkowski space-time, starting with Minkowski space-time, and when you, the thing is not a null hypersurface, it's just a real sphere, I can make sense of that. In the case of the horizon, because it's snow, it's a problem of trying to make sense of you are at a certain distance from the horizon. So you cannot make sense of you are what points are at the plank length from the horizon. So when everybody tells you a story that when you reach points that are at the plank length from the horizon, something dramatic happens. And it's telling you that this notion doesn't make sense. But if I'm just like an observer falling into a black hole, right? Yeah. They mean something like shortly, very shortly before I reach the uh, It depends entirely on how you're falling. That's true. For any particular observer, you would say you would be time length before in your clock you cross the horizon. Fine. I can make sense of that. And yeah, I know where the horizon is. But that will depend on the observer. It depends if the observer, this observer that falls in the horizon in this way, is going to do some have a very different notion of this observer mm -hmm. that falls to the horizon in that way. Yes, you will have an observer dependent story, not a. Right? You want to say that something happens there physically, whether there are observers or not. And then you're going to identify at which points these dramatic things occur. And these points are supposed to be those points that are, are observing dependent statement at the 
plan blink from the horizon. So you're saying basically any claim to the fact that some sort of theory, hypothetical theory of quantum gravity will yield corrections close to the event horizon doesn't even make sense. Yes. Right. Unless you violate dramatically and from the start the principles of GR. Yeah, you say that prefer frames, you say, you say all sorts of other things, then yes. But within GR, you're already, if you're trying to make sense of that, you're violating the basic principles. So my claim is that if, you, if your theory of gravity, quantum gravity makes sense in that sense, is violating from the start basic elements of GR. Fine, but then say it. But the, the problem doesn't apply to the Big Bang singularity because it's not enough. The, the, well, for me, this is not a singularity. The horizon is not a singularity. Yeah. I'm not talking about this is a singularity. The singularity? The singularity is a. Well, first of all, the singularity is not part of the manifold, but if it was, it would be space like. Okay, so yeah. this is easy. So look at all the horizon. Near the singularity, you can identify things. You can identify things being curvature equal one over Planck scale to the mm -hmm. power. Yeah. power. That's what I mean. That, 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 you know, curvature by curvature at the distance yeah, at, at, of, of, of size uh, one over Planck square. That, that would make sense, and this is a region around here. Yeah. Fine. But nothing to do with the horizon. So these statements do make sense. Like that statement would make sense. sense. That statement curve, for instance, you could go to the vial, get the Kretschmann, the so called Kretschmann scale. Uh, well, uh, it was like one or one to the four. You, you, could, you could ask at what point this happened, and this will define for you. In, in, that but this other, but this is something else. Is the is the distance to the horizon, which is okay. So other strategies that one can try to invent. So let's try something else. I can, in the case of Schwarzschild spacetime, I can consider, given a point. I can consider a sphere that is obtained by the rotational symmetry and contains that point. So that generate that I take the point, I apply the rotational symmetries and I generate the two sphere. Given that two sphere I can compute its area. Right? <coughs> and <coughs> I could ask when this area differs from the area of the horizon by Planck square, and that will give you the distance. Fine, you can do this. But number one, this has nothing to do with any distance to the horizon. And number two, you can only do it in situations of high symmetry. In generic situations, I don't know what to do. There is no recipe. So if you want to posit that something dramatic happens in general, at black holes, when you are at the distance in whatever main, well, you would like that notion to make sense for generic situations, not just for Schwarzschild spherical black holes. Uh, we, we, have, we have this kind of conversation yesterday, for the sake of everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I know your answer. The event horizon is a globally defined object. So where it sits depends on what gets thrown into the black hole 100 million years from now. Yeah. Yeah. So if anything physically happened at some fixed distance from the event horizon, you would have a weird teleological theory that needs to solve the whole damn thing before it knows what's going on locally. I agree that person. Good. I just I agree that. I thought that but, people, but, but, but people may try to defend them. I mean, I think this is. I think there is no defense against this argument. But if people try a defense like saying, oh, but we will only study the cases until we know that the thing is stationary, or something of that sort. Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. 
Uh, okay, so a colleague of mine proposed that we, we, we instead of computing this area, we compute the Kretsch, the Kretschmann scalar. So let's say that when the Kretschmann scalar, the Kretschmann scalar, I already mentioned it, for the Schwarzschild space time has this expression. And you could say the when the Kretschmann scalar has this differs by L P of the in the well in, 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 in the appropriate powers by by LP or, or less to the value on the on the horizon, then something special happens. The problem is that for, for a sufficiently large black hole, the value of this quantity at the horizon is as small as you want. Right? Remember, the horizon occurs at r equal to m. So this goes like m to the minus 4. So the black, very large black hole, this number will be as small as you want. And then you would be saying that here, something as dramatic as what is happening in the horizon <laughs> is also taking place. So if nothing dramatic is happening here, that cannot be the criteria for something happening in the, in the horizon. Um, Daniel, shall we have a coffee break now? No, I'm, I'm done. I think I'm done. Okay. Uh, so my final point is that, you know, <coughs> trying to talk about it, this is the statement I already made, trying to, to create a theory of this sort will violate severely the principles of GR and, 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 and special relativity. And there is no sin about that, but you should say it, say it clearly, say precisely how you are violating these principles and saying how you hope that, they, that GR would, would be recovered because you are from the onset violating aspects of, of, of the theory. You are supposed to be trying to, to understand more clearly by appealing to this to this uh, concept. So what you cannot do what you cannot do what is, <coughs> is to have your cake and eat it too. You cannot appeal and say, that we are clarifying GR, we are preserving all this, and in the middle of the discussion, bring up notions that don't make sense within that. So, so in, uh, in short, uh, there seems to be it seems to be, or there is enough indirect evidence and, 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 and many failures of, of attempts to validate this thing we call the generalized second law. We don't have anything that is close to accounting for it in a natural, in a natural way, and despite the successful calculations that produce in expressions for the entropy of a black hole being A over 4. So here I come to 